Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to walk you through my entire still life painting process step by step using a voiceover. Um, I'm really just talking about my whole process and my technique in this video. Um, I believe that this took place over three days. Each session was like anywhere between 50 minutes to a few hours. I never exactly know. I always feel like when I paint, I get sucked into a portal. <laughs> um, but I always start out my paintings in the same way, which is a primed canvas, a bright color. It really doesn't matter what the color is too much. I just don't want it white. <laughs> and then the next thing is that I just, uh, you know, it's a color that's usually really bright because I like to paint really bright. Then I go in with a drawing. I did this with a phthalo blue and white combination and just roughly mark in the painting. I am understanding fully that during this entire process, I will likely have to shift my drawing. You'll see there's a step in here called a redraw and that's where I can get things to be focused. The key to understanding my painting process is knowing that the thing that we're gonna adhere closest to when it comes to our process is working from very general to very specific. The analogy I like to think of is using a microscope. You're gonna start out anytime you're trying to find something with a microscope. I feel like this is like freshman year science, right? Um, you always look for it with it zoomed out as far as possible. And then once you find what you're looking at, you use the middle lever to sort of come closer to what you're looking at and get it sized. And then the final step is sort of fine tuning and focusing in. And that is exactly how my paintings work. So I'm still at a point where you can see I'm blocking it in. I'm using a larger brush. I want to say this is a size 12 flat, I think. <laughs> um, but we're going to go in and, and roughly mark it in. This is where you have to put out your inner perfectionist. I find that this process while you know a little labor intensive considering you're layering and layering and sometimes covering up the same spot multiple times the trade-off is that you don't have to be quite so focused on perfectionism uh, especially in the beginning i find that working with perfect clarity first of all i've never had the skill to be able to do that i'm always impressed when i see oil painters on social media who can sort of paint like a printer kudos to them that is not how i think and process things and so i would rather cover canvas very quickly, get things closer, and then begin to actually fine tune and find that detail. I think the finished product ends up being pretty similar. It's, I definitely have like an impressionistic uh, realism. I mean, it is within the realm of reality. The colors are a little exaggerated, but the, you know, the actual meat of the painting is delightfully rendered despite how brushy and light it is. And that's a fun balance to strike. And the way I get there is again, start general and work your way specific. So you can see in this step, I'm using this lime green color. Um, this is my redraw. Whenever I pick a, a color that I'm using for my redraw, my only personal threshold is just that it's, I'm not gonna get it confused for my subject. So if I was painting a bowl of limes in direct sunlight, I would not choose this color. Um, and since, <laughs> cause I'm tinkering with my light here, <laughs> but since I, um, everything in my composition is very peachy and pink and red for the most part, this is gonna contrast really nicely. Contrast not in the terms of like a finished product, but contrast in terms of, I'm not gonna get confused if this is, is this my redraw or is this my subject? That's what I mean by contrast. You know, and if the green shows up in the finished product, I think it looks nice. It's gonna contrast, you know, in the more compositional sense with everything. That's not my goal though. Uh, you know, I've seen other people use a similar style. I learned to paint this way from my painting professor in college who, um, you know, he learned at School of Visual Arts. So I've seen other painters use this. Nicholas Arubi is an artist, I think, does a lot of work on, on YouTube, actually. Um, he learned from Max Ginsburg. It's all in that same vein, and using redraw is a great way to sort of um, correct and get your painting back on track. That's definitely how I use it. And then when I go in and sort of, after the redraw, I'm filling in or covering up. I, I try not to think of it like filling in, but I'm going back in with a smaller brush this time. And now, not only am I correcting my drawing errors that I inevitably made in that first initial block in but I'm also beginning to find more detail so when I first went in my brush was so big that I couldn't actually find a lot of the like sprinkles on the cookie and like the flesh of the dragon fruit had to just be one or two different colors and values and once I really get into the meat of the painting I can start to make those choices it's also why whenever you watch my painting process uh, things will seem to happen really quickly at first and that's because I'm not being as critical I'm allowing myself mistakes. I'm allowing myself to move forward and make generalizations rather than really keying into detail. And once I get to nearing the halfway point, 
or certainly past that initial drawing and block in, then I do start to have more scrutiny. And the thing is, not only is it easier to work this way, but also it's easier to make more well-informed decisions about your composition whenever you already have more information. It's really hard to make good decisions whenever you know you have only a purple background with <laughs> blue lines on it. It's much easier to make decisions about detail and accuracy when you have the general shape of a dragon fruit or the general shape of a Topo Chico bottle or the general shape of a strawberry. And so that's sort of how I'm processing my, my, my whole process. And so I'm filling in a lot more of these shadows. Another thing to keep in mind that I think it's good to highlight with this composition is, you know, this is an older reference photo for full disclosure. It's a composition that actually I think still kind of makes its way around Pinterest um, a lot, which is always so fun to see because I, I took these series of photos, the one I'm using for reference, back in I think January of 2018 so it's it's an oldie um, I was doing a lot of still lifes and I would set up my compositions on my back patio with great Texas sunlight you know really direct really hot light even in winter and um, and I would take my process for setting up compositions is I would end up taking upwards of 100 if not more uh, different photos and you know I'd select maybe 10, 15 that I thought were really good. I'd edit them a little bit and play around with their contrast and color. And then I'd end up painting one or two of them. The nice thing is I still, you know, I don't have every single photo from that photo shoot, but I look back and I have like those 10 and I can go back and paint those now. Um, I was doing a lot of this, like archiving my old setups last year when I was creating my book. Shameless plug here. I'm releasing a book this June. It's called Modern Still Life from Fruit Bowls to Disco Balls. I'm really proud of it. It's basically a book form of my entire process. It has not only like great step-by-step -step full illustrations in full color, um, but there's lots of encouragement and everything you need to know to start painting with an acrylic practice. It's also a great book for oil painters. I will put the link down below. But during my whole process of creating this book, I was looking back at a bunch of my still life reference photos. I made completely new still lifes for the book, but during the research and um, the beginning of the process, I was deep in the weeds and I ended up earmarking a few of these that I was like, I want to reapproach it. And another thing is back in 2018, video content was still just kind of like a twinkle in the eye of Instagram. It was still like, I think they maybe started to roll it out, but it was nothing like it is now where, you know, video is king, which, you know, makes sense. Video is way more engaging and elicits a lot more dopamine than still photos. Um, but it's funny to think me as a two-dimensional artist, a painter, I really wasn't leaning into photo video content hardly at all. And now I'm repainting a similar composition that I know gained a lot of traction way back in the day but now I'm videoing it and it kind of feels like a full circle moment. Like if you've ever looked at my still life and, and wondered you know, how, how does this happen? How does this come to life? I actually think it's really fun to kind of show the process. In some ways I've had people over the years, you know, ask, does that demystify the process? What do you think about that? And like, maybe it does, but I, I feel like I'd rather have people inspired to paint and think that it's something that they can accomplish than maybe speaking to people who only like art that's very like, I don't know, smoke and mirror. There's a lot of smoke and mirror in the art world and I'm not, I don't know, I'm not too interested in that. So I'd rather kind of show the process and it's fun. It's fun for me to see too how it comes together because I can assure you at this point in the process, you know, I feel a little overwhelmed even with all the years of painting. So if I feel overwhelmed, I'm sure y'all do. And I think it's, it's helpful to see something come together. And I'm more interested in making more painters than I am you know, maintaining an air of mystery, even if the mystery helps my art career, I think that's kind of a stupid thing. I don't care. I'd rather, I'd rather educate and inspire. Um, so at this point you can see I've moved down to a much smaller brush. Um, you know, at this point in the composition, I probably will stick to size sixes all the way down to size ones, which are teeny tiny. I use flats and brights pretty much the entirety of my process, um, because I like the chunkier brush marks. Uh, but I am using a smaller brush so I can get more detail. And this is the first part that with the little heart with the gumballs in it, this is the first part of my process where I am actually entertaining the idea of like, I'm going to refine this to near completion, if not final completion. I generally 
like to save the highlights for the very end because I can get a little highlight crazy. Not every artist is like that, so do what you want to do. But I tend to go overboard with highlights. So I do everything minus the highlights. <laughs> um, but I am now sort of in my mind, now that I'm moving to the strawberry, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I can render the shadow to completion. Maybe I can render all of this. Sometimes I just make a little bit of progress and come back later. I just did a workshop this weekend where I was demoing and th those are always great because it gives me insight into what my process looks like for someone else and especially at real time like truly bless them because I think it's like watching paint dry um, this is so sped up but uh, one of the things that my students you know would ask me is like how do you know where to go next and I think that there are some guidelines you can use I tend to do my paintings darker value and work my way up just so I can have a better handle of my values which a value is just how light or how dark it's the dark and light component to color right so um, you know you can look at the strawberries and there's a lit red and there's a shadowed red and while they're both red the value is different and it's that value that's indicating the form of the strawberry the fact that it's three-dimensional um, and so sometimes I'll work from dark to light and then back down to dark and you know kind of navigate it that way but sometimes um, I will also be navigated by the fact that do I have red on my brush? I'm going to go ahead and do everything that's red. It just kind of depends. In the very beginning when I'm still kind of laying the land, you know, the first five minutes of this video more specifically. <clears throat> I will um, adhere to that value uh, process a little bit, starting dark, working light kind of thing. Um, or sometimes I'll block in the background first and then start dark and go light. It just kind of depends. I always tell my students, don't overthink it. You know, if you're having a hard time blowing out your values, you may want to more intentionally work through your value process, like basically start dark and go light and kind of stick to that until you get better at that skill. Um, but if that's not something you struggle with, then I always say like, go to what bothers you most. Pump the brakes. Don't completely resolve things, especially in the beginning. But once you get to where about I'm at in this composition, then you can begin to sort of fully dive into things and resolve things to completion, if not, you know, your completion. And go for what kind of feels like it's lagging behind. So when I'm working on this, uh, I'm a little bit cognizant of the camera. So I'm I, that part I was working at the bottom of the composition. Now I've moved up to the top of the composition. Full disclosure, that's something I'm thinking of. But had I not been filming this, you know, I would just say what part of this painting feels the least resolved and then worked there. You know, one thing I want to mention that I, I don't know if I said as I was going, I apologize for my hair being in the way, by the way. <laughs> you see the dark red lines all over the canvas. Um, that is another redraw line. So I will use a smaller, like skinnier brush, still a flat because I love those, but <laughs> to go ahead and like you can see on the orange um, juice bottle with the straw, I sort of just found that specificity. I would have never needed to find the actual shape of the end of the straw in the earlier processes. I just marked in the larger forms of the juice bottle, but then with the other redraw that it would have been my third redraw, I did have enough information that I put in all of those really precise details, like the exact shape of the end of the straw. And the nice thing about it is I don't have to worry about that shape because I know that this is part of my process early on and it allows me to move quickly. Now, you know, speed kind of gets a bad rap in painting in the sense that like it's only real true art if you've labored really hard over it. And I think that while that can be the case, and I think everyone's gonna be their own best judge of what that looks like and what rushing looks like, I will say that as a teacher and a painter myself, in incentivizing for students and newer painters to, to bust through that first process and just get stuff down on the canvas, I have found to be incredibly helpful because you often sort of overthink it. I mean, if you're brand new, sure, spend the time. But if you painted for even just a few months or certainly a year or more, likely you don't have to be quite as precious as you think you do with that first round. And what I think it does is it keeps you from getting deflated in your process too early on and then you never finish a painting. I find that if I can work a painting through that first redraw, even just that step, enough of it's finished that I can just go tinker like let's say I'm feeling overwhelmed by the painting if enough of that first if the canvas is covered and I've done a redraw 
I can jump back into that and maybe resolve one of the dragon fruit. And I'll, I'll tell myself, let's just do a dragon fruit and then we'll work on something else. But then, you know, most of the time I'll get sucked in and I'm all of a sudden I'm playing the game. I'm resolving things. I'm putting in colors and values. And I've worked on it for like two hours. And, you know, it's really helpful. I find that when you're still in a phase where you're just filling in the canvas, it's easy to get the sort of the wind knocked out of your sail. And I think one thing about painting process that we don't often talk about is motivation. You know, how do I keep myself engaged and excited with this painting? I feel that sometimes it's really easy in the beginning when you sort of have what you want your painting or composition to look like. And then you get into like the early middle stages, especially when you've worked on something and it seems to be getting messier, which by the way is totally normal. Um, it's easy to kind of get an overwhelmed. And so I think an important aspect to have in it as a painter is in addition to balancing color and value and form and drawing, I think that it's important to remember that motivation and excitement is also something you're navigating. It's easy to sort of think of ourselves as robots because like, yes, sure. If somebody came into your studio and said, I'm going to, you know, I don't know, do something really aggressive. I'm trying to keep up with guidelines. I'm going to light fire to your studio if you don't finish this painting in three days. Of course you could finish it. But the reality is that we normally, or at least I hope we don't, operate out of that much of a level of fight or flight for a painting, especially if we're doing it for leisure or practice. And so the intentional act of being like, listen, I'm going to know that I'm gonna lose motivation in the middle, like what can I do to help myself? How can I shape my process to where it's easier for me to get over that hump? I think that's worth investigating. And for me, what that looks like, and and it shows up in my teaching too, is that if I can just get my canvas covered very quickly before that motivation runs out, it's so much easier for me to re-engage. I would say it's like two areas that are really tough (laughs) to re-engage with is one, you've been working out for a long time and you still don't even have your canvas covered. Some painters can do that. I struggle. So getting it just covered in like, you know, you guys saw this process. It was covered pretty quickly within the first, you know, in reality, it probably took me maybe 20 minutes. In time-lapse life, it probably took five. (laughs) And just doing that, I know will help me stay engaged. And it's just as helpful as a decision as anything else. And the other step in my process that tends to really bog me down a bit is um, anytime I get a painting resolved almost fully to completion and it's a really big painting. This doesn't happen with smaller ones because if I'm almost done like I am at this point, I'm just putting in the details. I know that I have like an hour or less to work on it, no problem. But I had this 80 inch disco ball in the back of my studio forever because I completed it to about 85%. So in my mind, I can envision what it looked like completed really easily. And so my incentive to like solve the painting and get it figured out went way down, but I still had probably five hours of work left. I found that that was a really dangerous point of view, which is like, that's a bummer that it hung out in my studio for that long, but it it gave me a wonderful glimmer of insight, which is that if I ever have a painting that's really big or I do a mural, be careful of that like 85% completion, maybe work it to 95% or leave it at 75%, come back the next day and just be careful. Um, So even in our failures, you know, things where it's like, oh man, I never got back into that painting. We can still learn a lot about ourself, which is just as important as any other skill that we have as a painter. So here I am putting in the finishing touches. Hopefully that's, it's a satisfying thing to watch it come together. I know when I do demos, people always joke that it's like, it's blurry. It looks like a mess. It looks like, I don't know what I'm talking about. And then bam, all of a sudden it's resolved. And um, hopefully that's how this painting came together. So thank you guys so much for listening. Hopefully this was pleasurable to listen to, to watch come together. Leave any questions below. I am focusing on this channel for a lot in this year. I've put a lot of resources and intent into it. So I'm eager to answer your questions and keep conversations going. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed this and take care and happy painting. 